I'm Roman Yossi of the Nashville Predators. I'm Matt Duchesne of the Nashville Predators. I'm Eustace Aros of the Nashville Predators. I'm Ryan Johansson of the Nashville Predators. You're listening to the Renegades of Puck with Crazy Charlie. Welcome to the Bunker. Welcome to the Renegades of Puck podcast. I'm your host and captain, Crazy Charlie Sonny. And before we get started on the No Half Step in Hockey coverage, let me direct you to our home website, renegadesofpuck.com. Once you go to renegadesofpuck.com, you'll learn everything you need to know about the show. And once you get good and educated about the show, you can click on that merchandise tab. That's going to take you straight to our classic logo T, our pride logo T, and all of our different special event t shirts. But don't worry, all the gimmicks you've come to know and love from the Renegades Puck are still available in our online store. We've got socks, wall art, Bed sets, throw pillows, plenty more. After all, we've sold out so that you can buy in. Social media is a critical importance to this independent hockey operation, so listen up. Here's how you can help us out. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and also TikTok. So give us a like, give us a follow, give us a subscription on any of those platforms. Also, YouTube, of critical importance. We are really trying to up our subscriber numbers right there and our view count. So please, if you can, support us on YouTube with Renegades of Puck. TV by searching out Renegades Puck and giving us a subscription. You can also find the audio podcast on numerous platforms. Just search Renegades of Puck in your preferred platform or check out a couple of these following examples and options. We are on Google. We are on Stitcher. We are on Spotify. We are also on Amazon and several others. More Renegades than ever are hearing the show thanks to the Full Press NHL Network. We are so proud to be a part of the Full Press Network. Thank you guys so much stick taps love and respect to each and every one of you venmo is how you can become a sponsor or a partner of the show just go to venmo and search renegades of puck or scan the qr code that is currently on your screen thanks to generous renegades just like you watching out there and listening we've been able to make so many upgrades throughout the season it has been noticeable as you've been following along with the best of episodes just from the beginning of this season to where we are now we have made so many substantial and significant upgrades and that is truly thanks thanks to the support of each and every one of you out there this independent operation could not make it without your help look at the quality of the picture the sound and the editing that we have been able to accomplish with the upgrades we've made thanks to your donations again thank you stick taps love and respect to each and every one of you even a dollar goes a long way so please help us out if you can now it's time for me to get to the no half step in hockey coverage so let me deliver the goods it's time for operation number 751 that's right it's time for show number 751 and at this moment in hockey history we finish out the best of series for the season with the best of sean c smith he's got the intel that you need to know and he has joined us in the trenches in the bunker numerous times throughout the season i present to you now the best of sean c smith Thanks, Charlie. Hey, Renegades, it's Sean Smith. We don't have a Predators game to talk about right now, but we do have a few things to talk about as we sit in the middle of this All-Star break. While we haven't seen the Preds play, there's certainly a lot of things that we need to look at before they get ready to play again. And here's the biggest thing. Now, look, I'm not going to sit here and take credit for this because this wasn't anything I came up with. It wasn't research I did. But over at A to Z Sports, where I write, I write with a guy, maybe you've heard of him, named Alex Doherty. I think Alex is a phenomenal Preds writer, and he came up with this information today. Now, he tweeted it. It's out there. It's public. If you want to follow Alex, that is at Alex Doherty one That's Doherty spelled D-A-U-G-H-E-R-T-Y, and then the number one after that. You can follow him on Twitter. If you want to see this, check it out. Look it up. If you don't already follow him, you should follow him. He's got a good giveaway going on right now, too. But he's my site mate, and I think he puts out some good stuff. So I'm going to throw this out there a little bit. Here's what Alex said. I'm going to, I'm going to read it to you. This is good. So the Preds have 54 points at the All-Star break. By most predictions, they'll need at least 98 points total to make the playoffs. That's 44 points in their final 34 games. Now, he's given a few scenarios where this could happen. 22 wins, 12 losses. Straight up, that gets them the points they would need according to all of the models and predictions. 
21 wins, 11 losses, two ties. Losses in overtime, I guess you could say. That's, that's really what that is. Um, or you could even go 20 wins, 10 losses, four overtime losses, or 19 wins, 10 losses, five overtime losses. Would get them the required 44 points in their final 34 games. Now, here's the thing. He goes on to explain, and I, again, I'm trying to give you an update. Look, everyone else has been talking about the season so far. I want to talk about where we go from here. So this, this is kind of the thing. The good news is the Preds have been on a pace like that recently. Um, you know, he's... He says here, look, the Preds, this is after their last game, are now 12-6-2 in their last 20 games. That's 26 points and 40 points possible. If you spread that out over a regular 82-season game, that would be 106 points on the season. So they're definitely playing the way they need to to get the points they need in order to make the playoffs. And of those 12 wins that we just talked about, seven were over teams with better current odds to make the playoffs. Edmonton, Carolina, Washington, Calgary, Los Angeles, Winnipeg, and New Jersey. Now here's the thing. If we go back to the beginning of the season, one of the biggest things that was kind of lobbied at the Predators and, and kind of thrown up at them was like, yes, you've won some games, but you're winning against teams that are cellar dwellers. They're teams that are not going to make the playoffs. They're trying to suck hard for Bedard. I don't know. They're just trying to get a high draft pick. That's what they want. Now, the problem was they weren't winning games against teams that were headed to the playoffs. I even put an article about this out on A to Z Sports not too long ago. Look, if the Predators want to make a statement and say that they're going to be a team that can make it to the playoffs and then once they're there do more than get booted in the first round which has become the trend recently they're going to have to put up some wins against teams that quite frankly they would see in the playoffs now that was with the last three games for the all-star break and they did that they won those three games they made a big statement so as it stands they're on pace they're on track they're winning at a rate or getting points at a rate that would allow them, if everything works out right, to get into the playoffs. Now, Alex points out, too, that the most crucial part of the schedule that's left is going to be the final 16 games of the season because all but two games against teams with better playoff odds, again, as of today, with the only exception being the Buffalo Sabres, who recently beat the Preds, if you remember that, and, of course, they also have to play the St. Louis Blues, which was, of course, the loss that kind of pushed them into having that team meeting that seems to have turned things around. Um, and this, the reason I bring this up is that should give you an idea of where the Preds need to go. They're going to have to win some games. They're going to have to win some games against teams that are better than them, some teams that are ahead of them in the standings and have better chances to make the playoffs because a lot of those teams are teams that they're going to have to leap over if they want to get into the playoffs, teams that by beating them prevent that team from getting two points and gives the Predators two points, which that's when you really see a big jump in the standings. If we go all the way back, way, way back, to when I first started out, before Charlie ever had me on the radio show or ever had me on this, I used to do a, a little video segment called the Preds Game Plan ahead of every game. And what I did was talk about things to look for in the upcoming match. And I always had a little dry erase board that showed the standings. And I talked about, like, look, now if the Predators beat this team tonight, they're going to get two points. This team won't get any, so they move above. That's how Charlie found me. That's why we're where we are now. So I thought it would be nice to go back and do that a little bit. But Alex really kind of helped me out by doing some great research. So in the middle of the season, I know we're a little more than halfway through. But realistically speaking, we're at the All-Star break. In the middle of the All-Star break, that's where the Preds are. They're surging. According to all predictions, they're surging at the right time. And all the models say that if they continue to perform the way they've been performing over the last 20 games... They can earn the points they need to make it in the playoffs. The real question, Preds fans, as we've mentioned before, as we'll probably be mentioning again over and over and over, is can they do more than lose in the first round? If they can do that, I think they're making a statement. But if they make it to the playoffs again, scraping, scratching, fighting, biting, and clawing their way in, just to be unceremoniously kicked out after the first round, that should make for a very interesting offseason. Charlie, at the All-Star break, that's what I got for you. Renegades, good to see you. Hope everybody enjoys the break and hope everybody's ready to get back to some Preds action when this break's over. Charlie, sending it back over to you. Hey, Renegades, it's Sean Smith, and we're going to talk, before we mention anything about the Predators' overtime loss to the Canucks, I want to talk about something else. And I, I tweeted about this yesterday. It really caught my attention. I was really surprised. There was, a, there was an article that came out 
and I've, I've got, if you want to go to SESNSH and check it out, um, I, I quote tweeted it, and I took a couple of screenshots. And the article was about the top five waiver pickups over the course of this season in the NHL. Now, unsurprisingly, um, there were two of the five that were pickups by teams that picked up players that were waived by the Predators. And, of course, the third best overall pickup was one that I really think flew under the radar a little bit. And that was the pickup of goalie Connor Ingram at the beginning of the season after the Predators waived him upon returning from the Global Series. Now, what's interesting was that a lot of people said, you know what, good for Connor Ingram, let him go, let him get some NHL time. He wasn't going to get it here, and uh, they found a great backup in Lankanen. There didn't seem to be a ton of outrage at that time, but of course you have to keep in mind the context. The Predators are coming back uh, from just absolutely dominating in Europe. They came back uh, with a team that seemed to feature a lot of upgraded weapons, you had uh, Nino Niederreiter was added to the crew. He scored some goals, and uh, everybody was pretty excited about that. The Preds were 2-0 and to start the season. Kiefer Sherwood had put on a big performance overseas. It was, it was a good time to be a Predators fan. There was a lot of hope for the season. It seemed like the improvements that David Poyle had made in the offseason were going to have a big impact on the ice. Now, what's interesting about this is that they waived Connor Ingram. Now, Connor Ingram was acquired in, in a trade for a seventh-round draft pick. Um, I think he paid off to be a lot more than a seventh-round draft pick, and I think he's continued to pay off. But that was number three, number three on the uh, best waiver wire pickups of, of the season. And, of course, it didn't draw big outrage. I think it was circumstantial, situational. It happened at the exact right time, kind of flying under the radar without drawing a lot of attention. But the number one... Overall waiver pickup, Ellie Tolvanen picked up by the Seattle Kraken back in December after the Predators decided to cut bait for whatever reason and uh, let that go. That one did not go over so well. There was a lot of outrage, and it wasn't just outrage from a few fans that decided to be angry uh, that are always angry. It was, it was people who typically have very calm and level-headed responses to things. People like me, it, was, it didn't make a lot of sense. Um, people like, uh, I'd say, I'd say crazy Charlie, even as crazy as he could be, um, still doesn't get outraged at stuff unless it's worth being upset about. And it was upset about Ellie Tolvanen being waived. And what's interesting is that if I had quote tweeted that and put those two little blurbs out there showing that the number one and number three overall waiver pickups of the season were both from the Predators there would have been, two weeks ago, chaos. Chaos would have reigned. People would have been calling for David Poyle's job, for John Hines' job. They probably would have mentioned that Roman Yossi was a bad captain or something like that. They might have called for my job. I don't know. People would have been mad. There, there would have been pedal taverns turned over in the streets and set ablaze. Well, for whatever reason, when I quote tweeted this yesterday, hardly drew a bat of an eyelash from anyone. Some people were like, oh, well, yep, that happened. People have, since the news of David Poyle retiring and Barry Trotz's hiring, really, really, really kind of flipped a switch to where they are now not as outraged. They're not as mad about things. They're willing to move on. And I think that's what's interesting is that as much as they were angry, they've been just as willing to move on now that change is happening. And you're starting to see things happen that a lot of people have been asking to happen they've been begging for they've been clamoring for let's see the kids play is what a lot of people have said if you recall back to when david poyle teased the youth movement that never happened the competitive rebuild that wasn't and now this is a i'm not sure how they're branding this honestly there have been so many different things i can't remember but it's not a rebuild um it's, it's a reset i guess is what they're saying uh you're starting to see that play out and i'll tell you a couple of the things that i like I'm going to be positive and tell you some things that I like. What I liked about the Predators in their defeat by the, the Vancouver Canucks, first off, and it's not just last night, but the games before that, Luke Evangelista, he's getting the job done. He's making things exciting. Now, what's interesting is you've seen flashes of other players as well, putting on a good show, scoring goals, playing fast, looking good. 
maybe they don't have the hair that Evangelista has. Boy's got a fine head of hair. But here's the thing. Now that you've got some of these other players out of the way, either because they've been traded like Granlin and Niederreiter or because they're injured like Forsberg and Johansson, you're getting a real long look, a real good hard look at some top-line minutes from some guys like Luke Evangelista, Cody Glass, Tommy Novak, Philip Tomasino, although he's day-to-day. But you're getting a chance to see the kids play. And I think people like what they see. I like what I see out of Luke Evangelista. I've liked what I've seen out of Tommy Novak. I like what I'm seeing out of Philip Tomasino. There's so many new names to talk about that you kind of run out of time. But the cold hard reality is that people seem to be willing to embrace this reset. And I think that if you can avoid the... uh, idea here that the team is going to tank or intentionally be bad for the rest of the season to try to gain access to a unnamed number number one draft pick overall um, I think that the team has a chance to start a rebuild a few steps ahead and I think that's kind of what you want to see you're seeing guys go out and make a name for themselves and try to maintain a roster spot because there are a lot that are open right now and they've cleared up some some cap space. They have some room to play around with next season to bring in some short-term deals to not break the bank or get locked into big contracts. And I think that's what people are wanting to see. But I like what I've seen from Luke Evangelista. The other person, and this is big news to me, Tyson Berry. A lot of people said when they uh, heard that he was part of the return package from Matthias Ekholm, that they expected him to be flipped. When we talked to David Poyle, David Poyle told us that he liked what Tyson Berry was able to bring to the table with Edmonton's power play, scoring a lot of uh, points, goals, assists, what have you, um, as a part of the power play unit. A lot of people said, oh, yeah, but, you know, Connor McDavid's on that power play unit. (laughs) Maybe it's not really Tyson Berry. But Tyson Berry, since I'm going to keep saying his full name, think about that. Tyson Berry, since he's been here, has been getting to the net. And realistically, Evangelista's second goal last night was really just a tip in off of a great shot by Berry. And that's maybe it would have been stopped, but the guy's got a nose for the net. And I think that's what's important is that you're seeing a defender that can come in and make some offensive noise. And really, outside of Roman Yossi, that wasn't happening too much in Nashville. You think about a team that for a very long time has had their scoring kind of driven through the defense. It's very exciting to see another defender finally getting back in on the action. So, all that being said, there's a lot to be excited about. Sure, the Predators only came away with one point last night, but big deal. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. Alex Doherty and I talked on our On the Preds podcast over at A to Z Sports about how realistically the Preds had a better chance of making the playoffs than they do at, at tanking and getting the number one overall draft pick. But at the same time, it's still a pretty big leap to assume they're going to make the playoffs. Doesn't mean they shouldn't try. And as long as they're out there giving their all, I think you're going to have an enjoyable time watching this team for the rest of the season. Getting used to what some of these players can bring to the table and getting a preview of what it's going to be like next season when Barry Trotz, not David Poyle, has a chance to add some pieces to improve his team and get things going for the next generation of Smashville. Charlie? That's about all I have. Renegades, I hope you don't realize that Brian is too big of an idiot here coming up. A little bit of a preview for you. But, Charlie, I'm going to send it back over to you. Thanks, Charlie. Hey, Renegades, it's Sean Smith. We're going to talk about the Preds' loss to the Toronto Maple Leafs. Now, first things first, Bridgestone's getting a little bit out of hand with the opposing team's fans. They were all over Bridgestone tonight, very loud, got a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, <clears throat> not great in there, but let's let's say this. The, the team lost, and it's disappointing. It's disappointing for a variety of reasons, and one of the biggest reasons is the Predators somehow – still in this playoff race and and let me explain is that they're they're just five points behind the Jets and the thing is you see the Jets have played more games than the Predators the Preds have games in hand and and realistically if the Preds can win a few games here and kind of make up some ground then they're they're right in the hunt and the Jets 
as much as they're playing a much weaker schedule, they don't seem super motivated to win. It's, it's very bizarre, but, but here's the thing. Unfortunately, you know, the Predators played against the Maple Leafs tonight, and, and they are uh, the, the sixth best team at the time in the NHL. And, of course, the next team they play is the Boston Bruins, which happen to be the best team in the NHL. The Jets, in that same time frame, play one game against the lowly San Jose Sharks. Yes, it's the West Side Story game. As the Jets face the Sharks, there will probably be a lot less snapping than you'd like and probably a lot more bad hockey on the side of the Sharks. But that's what we mean when we say that they have a much easier schedule. The Predators are facing top-tier teams. The Jets are facing... I don't know. I wouldn't even... Are the Sharks even trying? I mean, they want to be last in the league, right? They want a chance at Connor Bedard. I assume they're not going to pull out all the stops to try to beat the the Jets. Either way. Either way. And and then again, at the same time, the Boston Bruins. I mean, they pretty much got this thing wrapped up. How big of a... How big of an effort do they want to put out against the Preds? Maybe the Preds can pick up some points there. And that's that's what you've got to remember headed down the stretch, is that it's not necessarily as simple as it seems. Until the Preds are statistically eliminated from making the playoffs, I think they're going to continue to fight. And fight's what I really want to talk about, and I don't mean punching. I mean playing your tail off every game. And that's you can be upset about the team losing. You can be upset about all the injuries. You can be upset about... The fact that the team is, is is this close to the playoffs and they're not getting the wins, which, which you can't be upset about, is the way these young guys are playing. You've got guys playing in the NHL right now that have been AHL players for the majority of their career. They're getting opportunities to play not just in the NHL, but to play a lot of minutes in the NHL against top-level teams in the NHL. If these guys are going to make an argument for continuing their career at the NHL level, this is their chance to make it. And you're seeing those guys put everything on the line. You can't tell me that Kiefer Sherwood hasn't played and given everything he has to give on the ice out there. He knows he's playing for his next season. And it's it's impressive to watch. And at the same time, you're getting to see a lot of guys that you'd only heard about before playing down in Milwaukee, the, the Luke Evangelistas and the Igor Afanasyevs of the world. And that's that's exciting. So a lot of people with the Duchesne news, Duchesne, of course, week to week with an upper body injury, looks like he stopped the puck with his hand. Um, Not good. And there's only a couple, it's only week to week for the season too. So uh, that's all that's left is week to week. So Duchesne more than likely, probably not going to come back. The reality here is that as much as this team keeps getting knocked down, they keep getting back up. They didn't hear no bell and they keep going back and fighting. And that's what you want to see out of this team right now. Yes, who knows what it means for the rest of the season. Most of the team's players that started the season with the Preds are no longer on the team or are injured. And that's that's not what you want. But we'll say this. Let them fight for the rest of the season. Let some guys make their case. Let them earn a spot on the team. Then everybody's going to get healthy in the offseason. And then we'll see what happens in the offseason with Barry Trotz as the uh, general manager. Maybe they can come back a lot stronger. Maybe they're going to skip some of those years of being down in the doldrums. And that's that's what you don't want, is you don't want to be the San Jose Sharks. My God, who would want to be in that position right now? Would you like to be a Sharks fan, cheering and, and hoping for your 10% chance at the number one overall pick? What a crappy way to live your life as a fan, just sitting there just hoping your team loses and sucks their way to the bottom so they can maybe have a 1 in 10 chance at a, uh, you know, trajectory-altering player, which is just a 1 in 10 chance. You you almost have better better odds shooting dice, man. Come on. Anyway, that's about about all I got, Charlie. I do want to say one more thing. If you were at Bridgestone, either of the last two nights of hockey... There was a very, very special opportunity that you may have missed, and, and hopefully it's not going away. But they've had some blackberry ice cream, it's purple for Hockey Fights Cancer, available behind section 107 at the Dippin' Dot stand, and I'm going to tell you that it is out of this world heavenly. Hopefully I've convinced everybody to go out and try it. Hopefully Sean Henry, the president of the team, had it 
and uh, understands that it needs to be made a permanent part of the Predator's uh, offerings on a nightly basis. But let me tell you, if you didn't get any, not only you're missing out, but you're doing yourself a disservice. If it's still there the next time the Preds play, I strongly recommend you go by and get it. And hopefully, if you're out there hearing this, you believe me. Oh, and by the way, Renegade, so nice to see you, so many of you out at the home base freak out too the other night. Tailgate Brewery. Had a great time talking to everybody. Hopefully I got up on stage and, and entertained you and didn't make a fool of myself. But it was nice to see everybody. And it's so nice to actually see the people who, who I'm talking to when I say, hey, Renegades. And I think that's I think that's awesome to be a part of this community where you guys all can kind of come together uh, around hockey. And uh, it, it's really cool. So thank you, everybody, for coming out. Those of you who couldn't make it, Hopefully you make it to the next one. Hopefully there's going to be a home base freakout three coming up at some point, but you're going to have to talk to Crazy Charlie about that. Renegades, that's all I got. Charlie, I'm going to send it back over to you. Thanks, Charlie. Hey, Renegades, it's Sean Smith, and we're going to talk about the Preds win over the Seattle Kraken and, and what it means. Now, the first thing you got to know is that the Predators, as it stands, are chasing the Winnipeg Jets for the final wild card spot. Right now, and when I say right now, I mean as I'm recording this, the Predators have won their game against the Kraken, earning two points. Kraken, of course, earning the loser's point, giving them one point. But the Winnipeg Jets are playing the mighty, mighty, mighty Ducks of Anaheim. And uh, right now, again, as I speak, and I'm going to look down at my screen here, so if you pardon me, um, the Anaheim Ducks have just scored on the power play. It is a tie game, 2-2 two to two, between Winnipeg and Anaheim with 14 and a half minutes left in the third period. Now, what that means is, and I want you to think about this, if the Ducks are able to pull off the improbable, that means that the Predators go into the rest of the evening and into tomorrow three points, just three points, out of the final wild card spot. If Winnipeg ties and loses, they'll have... A loser point, meaning the Preds will be four spots out, which is the first time they've gained ground in a while. But here's the other key thing that's really important. I want you to think about this. The Predators just played the Seattle Kraken. The Seattle Kraken have the first wild card spot. They've got 86 points. The Preds have 80. Now, they did give them the loser point tonight because they did go all the way to the shootout to decide who was going to come out the winner. But here's the thing. The Predators play the Kraken again. The Predators can win and earn two points and keep the Kraken from earning any points. They're within four points now of the Seattle Kraken. And then, of course, Winnipeg would have the opportunity to hurtle them, which would then make the team that the Preds are chasing for the final wildcard spot, the Seattle Kraken. So this game has had a lot of implications playoffs-wise, and the game on Saturday, the Pecorine statue unveiling game, has a lot of implications playoff-wise as well. So that's something to keep an eye on, is that there could be a shift, a very quick and a very dynamic shift, in who the Predators are trailing and who they're chasing and who they're in competition with for that final spot in the wild card. Now, our final spot in the playoffs. Here's the thing. Predators played... Not what I'm going to say an inspired game tonight. There were players that seemed like they were giving their all. But by and large, it looks like they, they kind of got outplayed several times, maybe in the first period, maybe even in the third period, maybe, according to Matt Duchesne, about 50-50 in the second. But they're going to have to come out and be a lot better against the Kraken on Saturday if they want to hold them to a regulation loss. And I think that's what the goal needs to be here because... Again, as I speak, I'm just sitting here looking at the score. It's tied. Winnipeg and Anaheim. Winnipeg could very easily pull ahead and win. They could go ahead and uh, they could, they could, even if they win in a tie, it doesn't really matter. They're getting two points, putting themselves back up two more points against the Predators, meaning they'll be five points up. So that's kind of what we're looking at, guys and, and gals. And, and the thing is, as long as hope's alive, it's exciting. And that's what it comes down to. It was an exciting game tonight, not because the Preds were playing inspired hockey, but because there was a lot on the line. You saw guys like Kiefer Sherwood give everything they had. Everything they had. You saw guys like Cole Smith give everything he had on the penalty kill to keep that game tight and to keep that game close. And they were able to pull it out in the end with some slick stuff in the shootout. And that's, that's where the difference was made. It was that their goaltenders, at the end of the night, 
Predators had the much better goaltender, and that's how things go. But you can't guarantee that's going to be the situation. But from here on out, especially in this game against the Kraken, they want a regulation win. That's going to do the most for them, and we're going to hope, as I sign off here, that the Ducks are somehow able to pull off the improbable and beat the Winnipeg Jets. Renegades, that's all I got. Charlie, I'm going to send it back over to you. Thanks, Charlie. Hey, Renegades, it's uh, Sean Smith, and we're going to talk a little bit about the Preds' loss to the Dallas Stars. It really sucked. Renegade, that's about all I got, so Charlie, I'm going to send it back over to you. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Renegades. Uh, sorry, just uh, having a little uh, popsicle here to wash the taste of a regulation loss of the Blackhawks out of my mouth. It's not, not anything that anyone wants. It's not anything anyone likes. But unfortunately, that's, uh, that's the result you're getting tonight. And here's what I'm going to say. I'm not going to drag it out. I'm not going to go on and on. You've got to remember, this team has lost a lot of players. And now they found themselves in the unique situation where they have an opportunity to make the playoffs. Now, what I like about this is that it gives this group of, of kids, really, there's a lot of young kids on this team, something to strive for, and they've been stepping up to the challenge. And you see a team like Chicago as a fan, even as a, an analyst, whatever, and you say, okay, you know, here's a team that the, the Predators should be able to push around very easily. But you've got to remember, the Blackhawks despite what I'm sure all their fans want, which is them to tank, right? They obviously want Connor Bedard. They've got something to prove. They're trying to prove they're not dead. Yeah, they've, they've lost Patrick Kane, and the season's not over. I mean, they're, they're not obviously going to make the playoffs, but they don't have a chance to make the playoffs. But still, they, they want to prove that they're not dead yet. And they proved that tonight with the win against the Predators. And it's unfortunate because the Predators really could have taken advantage of that Winnipeg loss to Boston. Um, you kind of knew that one was coming. Boston doesn't play around. They're on another level than the entire league this season. And if they're not Stanley Cup favorites, I don't know who is. But here's the thing. The Jets lost. The Predators lost. They gained no ground. They could have gained two points. They could have been within two points of a playoff spot. And with Winnipeg coming to town this Saturday. But you get the result you had tonight. And what can I say? You want me to break it down for you? The Blackhawks would not let anybody get into the offensive zone. They they stood those guys up at the blue line all night long. And even, and this was what was remarkable, once they did get in to the offensive zone, they'd be forced, pinched all the way down against the boards. They'd try to make a cross-ice pass and somebody open. Somebody was there to disrupt that pass almost every time. Almost every time. Now, you can, you can blame this on Fabro if you want. It, it's, it's, it wasn't his fault. I mean, the goal happened. Yeah, that, that, was, that was what it was. But this loss is not on Fabro. This loss is on the fact that Chicago was willing to stand dudes up at the blue line and make it really, really hard for the Predators to get anything going in the offensive zone. That's exactly what happened. That's, that's the thing you got to avoid. You've got to, uh, you've got to be prepared for that. They sent... Igor Afanasyev down to Milwaukee and brought Michael McCarron up for the matchup, and that didn't really seem to pay off. So the fact of the matter is, Preds are still down a lot of guys that uh, could be contributing, and they've got a lot of guys coming in that are trying to make a name for themselves and trying to trying to prove that they're they're worth sticking around at the NHL level, and this is a great opportunity for that. And and realistically, some of those guys tonight they they didn't shine, and that's what it comes down to. Chicago played a better game. Chicago defended that zone with everything they had. And once it, they did, once the Prince got into the zone, they didn't let him do anything. So, long story short, it sucked. And now I've got to eat the rest of this popsicle to get the taste of that L out of my mouth. Renegades, it's nice talking to you, Charlie. I'm going to send it back over to you.
<laughs> Sorry, everybody. Uh, Charlie uh, Renegades. Uh, you guys know what this is? This is a uh, Mountain Dew Baja Blast Freeze from the Taco Bell, and uh, it tastes pretty good. Not going to lie. There's not many things in life that taste better. But one of the things that tastes better is... 3-0 regulation win against the Carolina Hurricanes by the Nashville Predators tonight. Let me tell you what. If you're expecting this to be a blowout, you were wrong. Not only did the Predators not lose in a blowout to the Hurricanes, they beat them 3 to nothing. And, and guess where the scoring came from? Let's, let's name a couple of the guys who got goals early. Mark Jankowski. Did you have that one on your list? Did you place your bets at the sports books on Mark Jankowski scoring a goal? Probably not. <clears throat> then turn around, next thing you know, big sexy Michael McCarron scores another goal. Did you have Mike McCarron on your list? Did you, did you put a bet? Did you take your money, go down to the sports book, and place your money on Michael McCarron to score a goal tonight? Probably not. <clears throat> and let's be real, the Preds got kind of lucky, uh, I don't want to say luck. Luck's probably not the right word. There were two goals that were disallowed. One, because of goaltender interference, which was the right call. And two, because of an offside call that was delayed. And, and realistically, sometimes things just line up in your favor, right? Sometimes things go the way you need them to go. Think about the uh, Calgary win the other night over the, over the Jets, right? That was, that was a pretty big deal. Calgary beat the Jets. That helps the Predators. The Predators beat the Hurricanes. That helps the Predators. And then if you want to cap everything off after, after holding off a barrage of shots and, and frustrating the Hurricanes, Dante Fabro, the much maligned, often, often hated on defender in Nashville, Dante Fabro scores the empty net goal. What, what more could you ask for? You're getting depth scoring from a team late in the season during a playoff push playing against one of the best teams in the NHL. And you get scoring from your fourth line and from the defender that everybody loves to hate on for some unknown reason. The Predators, they're doing a great job. They're doing everything they need to do right now to make it happen. They've got two big games coming up against the teams they're in competition with for that playoff spot. They've got Calgary. They've got Winnipeg. Those are must-watch games. They're must-win games. Win those games? Punching your ticket to the playoffs, pretty much. I'm sure Brian will explain it better than I can. But like I said before, some things just go your way sometimes. Sometimes things just line up the way you need them to. And the results are pretty sweet. Charlie, Renegades, that's all I've got. I'm going to send it back over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. Hey, Renegades. It's Sean Smith, and we're going to talk. You know, I want to talk about the win over the Kings, but I'm going to say this. Uh, there's a few other things that are on my mind tonight that I think maybe we need to get out in the open here. First, I'm going to say this. Uh, exciting win for the Predators. Big win for the Predators. 5-3 game. A lot of, lot of excitement in the third period after... Uh, a lot of excitement in the first minute of the game, followed by a lot of uh, doldrums for a while there. And then after allowing the Kings to come back and score three unanswered goals, the Predators turned on the heat there in the uh, third period and made things happen, came back and won 5-3. Now, I don't know. I don't know who's watching this team. I don't know everyone's hearts and minds, but I would assume that most people watching the game are uh, – fans of one of the two teams playing now what does it mean to be a fan now we can we can get into all this stuff i'm not here to tell you what it means to be a fan you can be a fan of this team and you can think that the team needs a change that's fine i don't care if you feel that way that's great i'm glad that you're invested in the team enough to have a well-informed opinion about what needs to happen a lot of people are casual fans they like they like hockey. They're a Preds fan. They don't live and die by the team. They don't hang on to every bit of news that's out there about the team. They, they just watch the games when they're on, and they go, hey, look, these guys won the game. Oh, that's awesome. I like the Preds. Or, oh, these guys lost the game. That sucks. 
I like the Preds, and, and they go on. That's so, look, if you are invested enough in this team and you spend enough time watching the team and you spend a lot of money to watch the team and to buy the merchandise, then I fully understand, I fully understand why you could be frustrated with the direction of the team right now. I know one big win against the Kings doesn't, doesn't do all of the things and make everything better, that's, and that's fine. You can be upset about where the team is and where the team's headed. You can think the team needs a change. You can say that they need to fire the general manager. You can say they need to fire the coach. You can say they need to get rid of all the players, that they should be playing Philip Tomasino, or that they shouldn't have waived Ellie Tolvanen. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that one little bit. I don't. I really don't. Because that means that you have a, an opinion. And, and honestly, any opinion's good, but a well-informed opinion is one that I think is worth something. And that's good. You can also be a fan of the team and be just as invested as the others and say, you know what? I don't care. I don't care that the team is, is, is headed in this direction, or I don't care that maybe the, the general manager needs to go, or maybe the coach needs to go, or they need to tear the team down and rebuild but still enjoy the team winning, and, and that's fine. But here's the thing, and I, this is where I kind of have to draw a line in the sand, and I'm going to tell you why I'm going to draw a line in the sand here. It's okay to be a big fan of players. You can choose a favorite player. A lot of people have favorite players, players they love, people that they look forward to seeing play, players they make signs for when they go to the games, they go down to the glass beforehand during warm-ups to put their sign up on the glass and hope that guy sees it, cheer them on. I think that's really cool. You know, my, my son does that. My daughter does that. They've had favorite players that have been traded, both of them. They've developed new favorite players on the team now. And I, I think it's a really fun thing as a child to be a fan of a team and to, and to have parents that take you to games and things like that. I get that. You can be a fan of a, of a player. You can also not like specific players. I think that's okay too. I think realistically speaking, there are tons of great reasons to dislike players for things they do off the ice, uh, beliefs they hold, whatever that may be, um, and or, or the way they interact with with certain types of people you may not appreciate that and you know what that's your opinion and you're entitled to it i can support all of those things but where i have a hard time and i'm going to be really honest with you here is when you have a player do something that for them is exciting it's a career milestone they do something they haven't done before i think that's worthy of celebration cole smith scored his first nhl goal tonight it was not a decisive goal. It didn't push the team over to victory. It wasn't a game-winning goal. It was, it was just an icing on the cake goal. It was a deflection. It wasn't some elite sniper shot. It wasn't uh, where he did some, he didn't pull the triple deke off in a shootout or anything. Realistically, it was a greasy goal from a greasy guy. But it was his first. And I think that's something worth celebrating. And I'm gonna tell you why I think it's something worth celebrating. Think about Cole Smith for a minute. Don't think about Cole Smith the way you think about Cole Smith if you've got a problem with Cole Smith. Think about him as a, as a kid. Because at one point before he was the Cole Smith wearing this Predators jersey, he was a kid playing hockey because he loved the sport. And he probably played it a long time. My, my own son plays hockey. He's eight years old. He's played more hockey already at eight years old than I've ever played in my entire life. And I look at if, if his road, which... Goodness, we're short people. It may not happen, and that's okay. If his road leads to the NHL, he's going to be playing hockey for at least 10 more years before he even has a whiff of what that is or how close he is to that point. You know, Maybe he plays college hockey. Maybe he plays junior hockey. But it's a journey. And every hockey player you see out there on the NHL ice has been on that journey for their mostly entire life. We saw a really nice, if you were at the game, you saw a really nice piece on Alex Carrier's family following him on this past road trip in the car, uh, tr driving like the 3,000 miles just to see their son play. You know, and his dad made a really good point. He said, you know, the dream worked out for Alex. The dream worked out for Alex. But we had to make a lot of sacrifices. And so you've got to think that for Cole Smith to be where he is, there have been a lot of people that have had to make sacrifices to get, to get him there. Parents had to maybe take extra shifts to pay for certain 
aspects of hockey. Equipment's not cheap. Ice time's not cheap. Travel team fees aren't cheap. Maybe they had to get up extra early to take him to the rink. I don't know. These are things that I don't know. I'm speculating because this is a, an experience I'm on from the other side right now. But somebody had to get him to his hockey practice for a long time before he could drive himself. And what's funny to me is that he's gone through all of, the, all of this, spent years in the AHL, working his way, grinding it out every night, proving night in and night out that he's a guy that's going to give everything he has for his AHL team, and he finally gets a chance on an NHL team. Now, you can be mad that he's there. You can be mad that Philip Tomasino is not there. I've said before, that's fine. But he's here, and he's playing for the team that you're a fan of. And the team won, and one of the goals that helped them win that game was scored by Cole Smith. It happened to be his first goal. And people are mad because it, he's on the team, and he scored a goal. I, it doesn't make sense to me. And maybe people are mad because the team's celebrating it or the media members that are associated with the team are celebrating it and upset that that's something that people are celebrating. But at the same time, this all goes back to this is a guy playing hockey. He's playing hockey. It's been his lifelong dream. And he's unfortunately played for quite a few games before he scored his first goal. But he finally did it. He got the monkey off his back, as they were all saying in the locker room. And realistically, this was an exciting moment for him. And, and you know what? He was more excited to turn around and see his team cheering him on than he was about actually scoring the goal. The memory that Cole Smith's going to have of his first NHL goal is not going to be how it happened. It's not going to be what it felt like when he saw it go in. It's going to be what he saw when he turned around and looked at his teammates losing their minds on the bench for him. Because all those guys, and here's the difference between all those guys and all of us out here, they all know what that experience is. They all know what that's like to go from being a kid playing hockey and having to be driven everywhere by your parents and having your parents have to make sacrifices to get you where you're going and get you to do the things that you're going to do and you want to do. And they've experienced going all the way through that process to where they are now. And yeah, some of those guys over there make a heck of a lot more money than Cole Smith and they've scored a hell of a lot more goals. And that's good for them. But right now, Cole Smith has one. And I guarantee you that one goal is just as important to him as the two or three hundred that these other guys have. And if you're not happy about it, then I don't understand where your motivation's coming from. I'm not questioning your fandom. I'm not questioning your loyalty to the team. I'm not even questioning whether or not you have to like the guy. But if you don't get a little bit happy when you see somebody's dream get realized in front of a, a roaring crowd, much to the celebration of his teammates, teammates that you say that you're fans of, then I have to wonder where your heart is. Charlie, it was a good win. Great job for Cole Smith. Exciting time for that young man. And uh, I hope that's the realization of a lifelong dream that he's been working for. And I wish more people could respect it and at least feel a little bit of happiness for the guy. That's all I got. Charlie, I'm send it back over to you.